Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the BrainStream podcast. Colin and I are honored to be joined today by Dr. Steven Grossberg, who is the author of the book Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, How the Brain Makes a Mind. Dr. Grossberg is widely regarded as an important founding member of the fields of computational neuroscience, connectionist cognitive science, and neuromorphic technology. His work has focused on developing theories and supporting equations that can predict and understand the mechanisms behind learning, memory, and behaviors. He received his bachelor's degree at Dartmouth University in mathematics and psychology. He then went on to receive his master's at Stanford and his PhD at the Rockefeller University, which were both in mathematics. Dr. Grossberg began his professional career as an assistant professor at MIT, where he published a stream of conceptual and mathematical results about the many aspects of neural networks. In 1975, he came to Boston University, where he has continued to work for a whopping 47 years. In that time, he has been busy. He is a professor emeritus, which means that he retired with honors, of mathematics and statistics, psychological and brain sciences, and biomedical engineering. He currently serves as the Wang Professor of Cognitive and Neural Systems. Dr. Grossberg also founded the Department of Cognitive Sciences and Neural Systems, the Center for Adaptive Systems, the International Neural Network Society, the International Conference on Cognitive and Neural Systems, the Center of Excellence for Learning in Education, Science, and Technology. He has been published over 500 times and written 17 books. The book he is here to talk with us today is a culmination of the insights he has gained from all of the work he's done over the years. Believe it or not, this very long intro is only scratching the surface of his work, so I will include links to his book and research pages in the description below. All right, let's get into it. Yeah, so if you could just start by giving us a brief overview of the work that you've done over the years, uh, how you got started in this field, um, and what maybe the pivotal points in your research was and uh, what you're currently working on. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, I just published a book that I consider my magnum opus because I've published a lot of stuff before that. And it's called, as you noted, Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain. I want to say those words because I'll explain what they mean. And then how each brain makes a mind. And my goal there was to provide a self-contained and non-technical survey of high points of my work in the years that touches on the work of many hundreds of other people. And I wrote it in a conversational style as a series of stories because I'm trying to reach the most general audience I could. And I'll mention some of these high points as I go along. But you wanted to know how I got started. And I was real lucky I got started very young. Uh, Like a lot of college freshmen, I took introductory psychology. I was 17, and I was going to Dartmouth College. And at that time, there was a lot of data already available about human verbal learning, basically how we learn lists of things or sequences of things. It could be the alphabet. It could be a sequence of moves in a dance. It could be a sequence of navigational move, moves as we go from home to the supermarket. And um, how you how these experiments ran, you'd present the list over and over again at a fixed rate. And then you'd have a rest period. And then uh, the subject would continue practicing until the subject could predict the next item before it actually was presented on a few trials. So... It's the paradigm of practice makes perfect. You know, rote learning, how we all too often were learning uh, in the past. And um, the data really shocked me. And that's because um, if you look at the cumulative number of errors at each list position, the middle was harder to learn than the end. So you had an inverted U in the number of errors from the first to the last position. And that was very odd because you might have imagined that as you get deeper and deeper in a sequence, there's more and more interference from the preceding line. So it should have gotten harder and harder, but it didn't. Right. And this did, they, did they know um, how many items in a sequence there would be? Well, this was... 
one of the holy grails of 20th century psychological theory. This kind of paradigm had been studied in hundreds of experiments where you would vary the nature of the items, the length of the list, the amount of rehearsal. So this isn't a one-shot deal. This is a classic. And it was considered a kind of holy grail because it seems so odd. In particular, if you increase the rest interval between successive practice trials, the whole distribution of errors would change. Hmm. And that fascinated me because it meant the non-occurrence of a future thing could influence how the whole past worked. So stuff was going backwards in time. Well, for a 17-year-old, backwards in time is pretty heady stuff. I got so excited. But moreover, you know, let's say I practice A, B. They could be any things. Well, you'll also automatically practice B, A. You'll know B, A better just by practicing A, B. So that meant sure. stuff went forward and backward in time in both directions. What did that mean? But we all know we can learn A, B, C. So going to the future from B to C was some reason stronger than going into the past from B to A. Well, what did that mean? And <clears throat> so because you had these states like A, B, and C that interacted in all directions, I knew there had to be a network there. And because everything depended on rates, it was changing dynamically in time. So although I was a kid, I knew I needed differential equations, which are the way that scientists explain how things change in time. And by studying this carefully, I realized I needed, act like A, it had to get activated and then B had to get activated. So I needed cell activations or short-term memory traces. And then the cells send signals to each other. And you have to have adaptive weights or long-term memory traces that can sense an association from A to B as well as one from B to A. So I introduced short-term and long-term memory traces. The wow. long-term memory traces do the learning. But you see why we have to have a network, it's because of backward learning. And then shortly thereafter, I realized I needed medium term memory, which is just activity dependent habituation, how cells got tired. And so in this way, I introduced modern neural networks, including the laws of short term, medium term, and long term memory that are still used today. That's and incredible. I use these laws to explain a lot of things, but among them I explained the holy grail of the classical serial position curve. And you might say, well, how does a freshman in college manage to do this? And I think once you're of a certain age, you realize you can work like a dog, but you have to be a little lucky. And I was very lucky because the chairman of psychology, Al Hasdorf, and the chairman of mathematics, John Kameny, both believed in my work. And one reason they believed in it is I wrote, as they told me, the best exams they ever received. So I was working hard. Sure. To be noted. Some credibility. And Al Hasdorf was a remarkable man. He went on to become very much loved provost and vice president Stanford. And John Kemeny was one of the co-inventors of the computer language basic, which had a foundational wow. role. Yeah. And yeah, also seriously. one of the designers of the first time sharing computer networks. So John was a great computer pioneer. Well, maybe that's enough for the first question. <laughs> wow, that's that's a whole lot to unpack. Yeah, well, I hope you can see how a kid can see there had to be networks because if you study verbal learning, there's backward and forward learning. Right, and absolutely. Connections in both directions. They both have to be learnable by some kind of an associative learning. And <laughs> it turns out that 
I studied a lot of data that was available then, and that data was sufficient for me to write down laws that have stood the test of time and been a foundation for explaining many other things. Yeah, I mean, I I just think that the approach um, is so interesting to looking at these problems because a p- part of my major, I'm an undergrad right now, um, you know, the largest part is neuroscience, but through traditional neuroscience um, training and classwork, it's a very reduc- reductive mindset, right? And so we're looking at biological features that try to give rise to these larger things. And honestly, we we haven't really dealt much with the concept of of consciousness, which is unfortunate because it's one of the most, you know, one of the most, if not the most interesting topics that are out there. And so I think that it's interesting that you've certainly come to neuroscience and and interest in in this area, but it sort of came from a more um, like trying trying to put human behavior into into equations and approaching it from a different angle and seeing these patterns um, as opposed to going the other way and trying to figure out what the underlying mechanisms well well i have to emphasize i've always considered myself a psychologist and the reason is is that a brain evolution needs to achieve behavioral success it doesn't it, it doesn't matter if you have gorgeous neurons if they can interact together for you to succeed behaviorally, then Darwinian selection will wipe you out. And so from the start, I was interested in the dynamics of how brain mechanisms give rise to psychological functions. And as I've just indicated, I wasn't trying to derive neural networks. I was trying to understand how humans learn. Neural networks naturally came out as the computational embodiment of what you need to understand how humans learn. And um, if you ask, well, what is the difference then between a brain and a mind? (coughs) What makes it so challenging is interactions between multiple brain cells and multiple parts of our brain these interactions give rise to the emergent properties that mimic our behavior, okay? That's why the physical brain seems so different from the mind, because there's this leap to emergent <laughs> properties. It seems like you really ran headfirst into this mind-body problem at a really young this age. This is the mind-body problem. <laughs> yeah. And so the art of modeling is... To be able to understand how these emergent properties occur and give rise to psychological experiments in the most varied kinds. And starting in 2017, I was able to accumulate many results over the preceding years to start rigorously explaining in a, a, a way that could explain a lot of data how conscious states of seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing arise and unify psychological, neurobiological, anatomical, biophysical, even biochemical data. And it's in this sense that the work is making a proposal to solve the mind-body problem because you're linking between psychology and the finest kind of data in neurobiology, and it's not merely explanatory. It's really also predictive because scores of my um, predictions have been confirmed. And you might say, well, my God, if scores of this guy's predictions have been confirmed, why don't I read it on the front page of the New York Times? Well, unlike people like Albert Einstein, I didn't study the solar system and the universe. And when there's something weird happening at the perihelion of Mercury that everyone can see in the sky, well, that's something you can write about in newspapers. But despite that, since at least 1989, serious people have called me the Einstein of the mind, for what it's worth. I don't know if you want to talk more about consciousness or what do you want to talk more about? I just got to I just got to quickly say this is a, an amazing discussion. I you know I I really it's really interesting to hear 
this 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 progress that you've made. Um, and, and what's even more interesting to me is that you were able to sort of come to these insights without the modern tools that we have today with the um, the fMRIs and the EEGs. I wouldn't put it quite that way. During the last, I don't know, 150 years, psychology and neuroscience have accumulated really one of the largest databases in the history of any science. And multiple methods have been developed, even during my own work, which has gone on for 64 years. I'm 81 now. I made the discoveries I'm mentioning when I was 17. And, you know, one of the questions that one might ask is, why haven't I hit a brick wall? But the multiple methods used by experimentalists range from psychological experiments to functional neuroimaging experiments to multiple electrode experiments in weight-behaving monkeys. And all of these methods are like studying the proverbial blind man and the elephant. You know, this old story, you're looking at the mind, in this case, which is the elephant, from different perspectives, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. And my work has as its task to provide a principled and unified explanation of all these kinds of experiments and to make a lot of testable predictions. And as I say, quite a few have been supported. But a lot of the things I've studied are, for me, acquired tastes. Like when I've uh, explained and predicted, which has been supported by multiple labs, although there was a fragmentary substrate before how acetylcholine released by the nonspecific thalamus through the nucleus basalis is injected into multiple parts of the neocortex in layer five and increases what I call vigilance and thereby changes the course of learning. And if it breaks down in specific ways, it can lead to symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and autism. So these are things I never dreamed I would have anything to say about. So the whole point about a principle theory, as opposed to just an, you know, a tool to compress the description of experimental data, is a theory has fundamental principles and laws that can drive you into areas of data and thought that you never thought you would be feeling comfortable in, let alone be able to contribute to. And so, um, but I got to say that, you know, this is not inherently a technical thing. I talk about all these methods. Um, the tools themselves, you still have the blind man trying to describe the elephant. My main gift, which I treasured and try to be worthy of, is experimental intuition. For reasons I can't explain, I can see to the heart of data. I see it, I feel it, before I have anything that I can write about it. But because I did get enough technical training, I have, among other things, I'm a professor of mathematics, I also have the technical tools to try to express these intuitions in rigorous models that can be quantitatively tested. And this kind of work has synthesis, really, has led me to be recognized, I think it's fair to say, for the last 50 years as the leading pioneer in current research leader of a revolutionary computational paradigm, which I like to call, I think other people feel comfortable with it, autonomous adaptive intelligence. Like what we're doing with this conversation, where autonomously there's no puppeteer adapting online to what we're hearing and exhibiting at least some glimmers of intelligence. <laughs> so, and a prime example of it is how each brain makes a mind, which is why my book has that title. But I got to emphasize that the brain embodies universal 
design principles, both for biological and artificial intelligence. And let me tell you one of many, but really a basic reason why I feel that very strongly. So in 1980, 41 years ago, I was able to publish in Psychological Review, which was then and arguably still is the leading theory journal in psychology, a thought experiment. And I don't know if you know about thought experiments, but you know, Einstein is elevated thought experiment is how he derived general relativity theory. And when you can finally uh, offer a thought experiment, it means you've sort of gotten to the heart of the problem. You've stripped away non-essentials. And a good thought experiment, in this case, is a thought experiment with a few hypotheses that are all familiar to everybody. You don't have to take psychology. You don't have to take neuroscience. But why are they familiar? It's because they represent ubiquitous environmental pressures on the evolution of our brains. They're built into us. So, you know, they're very familiar because that's why we are who we are. So what is the thought experiment it's about? It's about how any system can autonomously correct predictive errors in a changing world. Autonomously, just like our conversation, all by itself. Predictive errors because if the world changes, maybe you need to learn a new answer. Or if the environment in a non-changing world gets more demanding, maybe you need to refine your answer. And so my thought experiment led directly to adaptive resonance theory or art without ever mentioning the word mind or brain. So art is a kind of universal solution to this problem. But in the context of mind and brain, I think it's fair to say it's currently the leading cognitive and neural theory of how our brains learn to pay attention, to recognize and predict objects and events in a changing world that's filled with unexpected events. That's the whole challenge. How do you deal with the unexpected? And I say that it's the leading theory because all of its foundational hypotheses on which it was derived have been supported by subsequent psychological and neurobiological data. And it has helped me and many others to explain the data in hundreds of other experiments. And so significantly, the derivation never mentions mind or brain. So I believe that how our brains make our minds will play a big role in all types of autonomous, adaptive, intelligent applications in the science and technology of the future. There will be variations on the theme and specializations, but our brains look the way they do for rather deep reasons, as the thought experiment in this case is. There can be species and individual variations, but it's not accidental. They embody in a, a dynamic state, but it changes so slowly that we call it me rather than a differential equation. A dynamic state, um, really competent adaptive solutions to specific environmental problems. <coughs> And what these problems are, I like to say, are general purpose solutions of what I call modal problems, M-O-D-A-L, for different modalities of intelligence like seeing and hearing and thinking and feeling and acting. All of them are built on the same small set of equations like the short-term, medium-term, right. and long-term memory. Then there's a somewhat larger number of microcircuits or modules that can carry out a variety of tasks, but not everything, not general purpose like a von Neumann computer. And then the small number of equations and the somewhat larger number of modules are specialized to form architectures for different modalities like vision, uh, hearing, speech cognition, emotion, action, and so on. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to focus on sort of the the how and why we have we have minds and we have this focus. And as you were talking about, the the brain is very well equipped to try to do these simulations to try to predict what might happen in the future. And and obviously the um, the the benefits of which are quite apparent, right? If you're trying to track uh, a prey item, then you want to try to be able to know where it's going. Or especially, I think in interhuman communication, I think that there's a lot to look at there. You have mirror neurons that are trying to get you to simulate what someone's face is doing so that you can try to understand what their emotions might be. Or we look at so many of these little subtle aspects of of communication. And I think that it's all interesting that it sort of comes together, um, all of these aspects to try to, um, to try to you know, create this this understanding of, of what's going on to help us um, understand what's going to come next. And so would you say that um, that consciousness is largely as a result of that trying to predict um, events that are that are coming up or, or um, improve reactions to that? I mean, we don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, today let's do consciousness, right? I mean, what is the question? It's an easy question. What well, are you talking about? I was always fascinated with how we learn. Sure. One of the reasons is, as a student, I spent my whole life learning. But um, from the very start, I wanted to understand how we learn quickly, like I learned your faces within half a second. And I'll remember them for a long time. Well, why don't I forget them as quickly as I re- learn to recognize them? So we want to be able to learn quickly without experiencing catastrophic forgetting. And I've called the solution that I call that problem the stability plasticity dilemma. We want to be plastic to learn quickly, but we want our memories to be stable against irrelevant uh, environmental perturbations. Like if we couldn't solve the dilemma, you'd be afraid to go outside. Of course, by learning someone's new face, just like I learned your face, you'd be afraid you'd forget your mom's face. And that's a serious matter. It's really fundamental. And so I studied that frontally, and I realized that to do it, you needed top-down learned expectations, as I say, from high regions of the brain toward the periphery where bottom-up data are coming in. And these expectations focus attention on what I've come to call critical feature patterns, the subset of features to which you pay attention because they predict, as you were commenting on, predictive success. And you suppress the other garbage. You never learn about that. You don't clutter yourself up with that. And when there's a good enough match between the bottom-up signals coming in and the top-down expectation, that is active at that time, that's being read out from a recognition category that's trying to be learned at the same time, when there's a good enough match, the system goes into a resonance, a self-supporting resonance state. Boom, 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 boom. And that resonance tends to synchronize the attended critical feature pattern in the category to which it's linked. And the resonance also sustains your attention for a while. So much stuff is happening all the time, but when you're paying attention to something of interest, it stays active on the critical feature pattern through the recognition category long enough so that the adaptive weights in the bottom-up pathways, the adaptive filter, and in the learned top-down expectation can learn what's going on. They can learn the critical feature pattern. And because this sustained attentive resonance drives learning, that's why I call this theory adaptive resonance theory. And this particular resonance is called a feature category resonance because it links critical features to the recognition category that represents them. And that's how you learn and dynamically stabilize it. And after I realized this, I realized Holy dash, 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 dash. Um, we'll put a beep in. 
<laughs> the critical feature patterns in many situations match the parametric properties of the conscious experiences that they're representing. So I realized that a feature category resonance is supporting conscious recognition of attended objects and events. So through a study of learning, I was led to adaptive resonances that support at least conscious recognition. Very cool. And I, I think it's very interesting in, you know, just looking, looking into learning and memory and sort of what you were talking about when you're presented with new information, how previous information experiences and things that we know informs that information coming in. And it almost has to get to another point. If that information is truly novel, it kind of takes us a second to recognize this and attempt to classify it with previous things that we have. And so I think, you know, just a, a good example of that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you when you look at an object and your brain immediately says like, oh, that's that's X thing, that's a cat or something like that. And you see it as a cat and you see it as a cat. And then maybe you kind of turn the corner and it's and it's something else totally different. Um, maybe it was like a, a sign or maybe another animal or something like that. And then your brain just kind of switches. And it's like, oh, now I see it the right way. Okay, well, well, this gets into a whole series of issues. But the first issue is, that when an input comes in and goes through a bottom-up adaptive filter, that bottom-up adaptive filter is embodying everything you've ever learned in that modality. And then you're choosing among the possibilities for the most likely one. And if the most likely one happened to be a, a, a recognition category for a cat, and you read that out and you got a feature category resonance for a cat, and it then predicted cat through a visual to auditory associative link, you'd say cat, but then as you get closer and you start paying attention to a richer set of features in the critical feature pattern, that can cause a big enough mismatch, and the mismatch can drive a memory search to find a better predictive category or what you're seeing. Yeah. So if you have a good enough match, then you can go into something like a feature, excuse me, category resonance. But if you have a big enough mismatch, then the brain automatically, this is in R, goes through a kind of memory search or hypothesis testing to discover a uh, a recognition category that can provide a good enough match to resonate. Now, sometimes it's going to be a, a category you already know because you're in a given situation and certain categories were active, and now you go in a new situation, you get a reset of your attention, and so you readily go to a familiar category. In fact, Gail Carpenter and I prove that you'll go to the globally best matching category. There's no local minimum problem. You go to the globally best solution, okay, without search, that once you choose it, the top-down expectation will confirm it through resonance, and then it will be consciously recognized, okay? So you have this duality between an intentional system where you do the learning, and then an orienting system, which is detecting big enough mismatches in the intentional system to drive the search to the of a better matching categories, whether novel or already in your repertoire. Well, this this probabilistic mathematical approach that you've taken is is just incredibly interesting to me. Um, so, on that note, though, of consciousness, um, you know, a lot of people consider consciousness to be sort of a spectrum, right? Um, would you say that that certain organisms are conscious whereas others are not so for example consider us and then consider like a squirrel well it's an important question and what i would say is if an animal can solve the stability plasticity dilemma and it uses top-down expectations and attentional matching to do it then i think our task is to study it further 
uh, using all the experimental tools we have to discover the extent of its awareness. Mm-hmm. For that is the core. As I said, it's a learning problem. And once you get um, feature category resonances, uh, conscious recognition isn't far behind. Um, on the other hand, it's not the only resonance that I've studied. And, you know, one of the, one of the issues that comes up and, and which I think is one of your possible questions is why evolution was driven to d- discover a state of consciousness in the first place. And this might be a good time if yeah. it seems so to you. Absolutely. No. Yeah. yeah. Please go for it. So, um, so you need multiple stages of processing uh, to occur, for example, between light signals hitting your retina and you consciously seeing something. So now I'm switching from recognition to seeing. They're not the same because you can see anything, whether you know what it is or not, but you can only recognize stuff you already know about. Okay, mm-hmm. so seeing and recognizing interact a great deal when we see and know something familiar, but you can see stuff you don't know anything about. Okay, well, why do you need multiple stages of processing? Well, I don't know if you know, but especially if you wear wear glasses, as at least one of you does. Yes, I do. You know, if you go to the ophthalmologist, sometimes they wiggle a little flashlight on your retina, and suddenly you realize that it's covered with veins, Mm-hmm. And that there's a big hole in it, which is blind. Mm-hmm. The blind spot is where the optic nerve forms from photo, photo detected. This blind hole in the retina is as big as the fovea, which is where we see high acuity vision. vision. But we're not usually aware of it. I won't take the time to explain why today. Except that it's clear that you've got to go from this incomplete retinal image to a complete surface representation if you ever want to look at and reach for objects that happen to fall in the blind spot. Right. And so it takes multiple processing stages to go from that incomplete retinal image into conscious seeing. And a great deal of the subject of how the brain sees has to be devoted to understanding that. So it's not something you want to necessarily explain in five minutes. But what you can immediately say is if you need all these processing stages, then how do you know what stage has completed the surface representation? So you could use that stage to guide looking and reaching and not some earlier stage, which gives you some crappy representation and if you use the crappy representation, you get the wrong answer. And sorry, in the forest primeval, you're someone's lunch. And the answer is the complete surface representation is lit up by a conscious resonance, which in this case is predicted to occur between pre stride cortical V4 and the posterior parietal cortex. And because it's lighting up a surface representation of the objects you can reach and look with it, it's called a surface shroud resonance because the attention fits its shape to the shape of the surface and is called a shroud. So this a resonance, just to summarize, for conscious seeing. Mm -hmm. And what I've done in my work, as you, you might have noticed in my book, I talk about six different conscious resonances for things like um, seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing. And then I talk about why not all resonances are conscious and why lots of processing isn't resonant at all. So adaptive resonance is not everything. It's important, but it's not everything. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, the word resonance there is is so important because it's not it's not that you can clearly draw a line between like specific points or, or even circuits within the brain and we say okay we have crossed into 
into consciousness. And I think, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong in any of this stuff, but I think part of this this relationship that we have is there's a tremendous amount of feedback through the different layers that we have in the visual system, where some of these areas you talked about V4, um, which is a a couple steps down the processing chain and then the posterior parietal cortex, which is also kind of in a split stream looking at where something is going. Um, And and it's it's it sort of keeps going back and checking with itself um, to figure this out. And so V4 is in the what stream. V4 is in the what, but the posterior parietal cortex is in the where stream, right? That is definitely correct. But before we go on, what I wanted to emphasize was it doesn't just stay resonating in V4 and posterior parietal cortex. Right. When V4 starts resonating, it now starts resonating downstream, mm-hmm. all the way down even to lateral geniculate nucleus at least, using right. what's called the art matching rule to focus attention on the combinations of features that are supporting mm-hmm. that conscious seeing of this surface. And parietal cortex in turn goes up to prefrontal cortex right. to organize our plans for what we're going to do about it. And right. you're right about PPC because you have form perception, which is mainly what the what stream does, and motion perception, which is what the where stream does. They both have complementary strengths and weaknesses, and they interact together across stream to overcome those complementary weaknesses. And then the completed representation uh, in the motion stream, like MTMST, and then you go up to PPC and prefrontal. Yeah, that, we, um, I'm not sure how neuroscience literate the the audience is. They're definitely interested in it, but um, but but basically, we should just explain um, that base. You have uh, different levels of processing from the raw data kind of coming in from the retina where it starts to try to look at orientation and direction of objects. And then this sort of splits off into two different processing streams. So we have the dorsal stream, which is what we're talking about when we say posterior parietal cortex. And then when we're talking about um, MT and V4 and all of this other stuff, we're talking about trying to classify what the object is. And then of course there is always overlap in these things because what an object is and what it does in space are very often related. And so this kind of helps us build this model. And I, I'm curious if, if you would say that, that this piece is correct, but when I think of consciousness, I think of it as something to try to aggregate all of this data and almost simplify it so that, so it's taking something that's very complex and almost simplifying it so that we can develop a better understanding of what's going on. And it's not like it all emerges on this one neuron. It's like, okay, now we have a conscious representation of this, but this emergent property that you were talking about before, the prefrontal cortex is planning based on stimulus that it has gotten in other areas are drawing from other sensory information that we might be getting. And all of this together, even if, you know, this neuron and this other neuron aren't immediately connected, to the, the act of all of them working together sort of creates what we think of as consciousness. Um, is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, yes, I like it very much what you said, especially, you know, noting that in the form stream, it's orientationally based, in the motion stream, it's directionally based. And a key point, which you didn't explicitly make is you know, why do you need two streams in the first place or what in the rest stream? And the reason is, if you look at the properties of how you process the orientation of static objects and the direction of moving objects, they're computationally complementary. If you can do certain things well for orientation, then you don't do a very good job with motion direction and conversely. And you need these two streams. But even with the two streams, they have weaknesses. Now, as to complementary computing, you know, you were talking about the extent of consciousness, and a key point is that adaptive resonance theory is part of when when we're looking at recognition of objects, I'm not talking about now recognition of movements, 
And then there's cross stream interaction. So it, it does get more complex, as you noted. Mm -hmm. um, that is excitatory matching. If you get a good enough match, you go into resonance. Mm -hmm. And it's a form of match-based learning because you're matching input, bottom-up inputs with a critical feature pattern. If you get a good enough match, you go into resonance. But the wear stream, which is supporting action in the world, is complementary to that. In particular, when I learned to recognize an object in the posterior part of what's called the intratemporal cortex, you'll get representations that are sensitive to the object's position and size and location mm -hmm. and all that. And there are infinitely many variations of those parameters, and you don't want to have a combinatorial explosion, so you got to get an invariant object or category, and right. that's done at the very next stage, mm -hmm. okay? which is the anterior part of the intratemporal cortex. It's extremely efficient. You know, unlike deep learning, where you might have a hundred layers to do right. less, here you do it in two compact regions. But by virtue of making a representation invariant, it's then invariant on the position. So you can't use it to reach or look. Right. And that's why you need a wear stream. Mm -hmm. Moreover, the learning in the West stream has to be totally different because my arms now are not the same arms I had when I was a baby. They're bigger. Right. And when I work out, they're stronger. The games are totally different. Mm -hmm. And so the Watt stream has excitatory matching and match-based learning to support adaptive resonance to solve the stability, plasticity, dilemma, and let us become more and more expert about the world. Right. The wear stream has mismatch-based learning. It has mismatch processing and mismatch-based learning in order to learn the spatial representations and the motor gains to move my limbs. And because my limbs are always adjusting, not just when I grow up through my puberty years, but when I go to the gym or I, you know, hurt a muscle. So this does not solve the stability plasticity dilemma. It does experience catastrophic forgetting. But in this case, all it means is that the controller for action stays tuned to what you're controlling to move. So these are complementary, a very big complementary Lip. Absolutely. In recognition and action. Mm -hmm. And the motion stream feeds a lot into that action. Because often the things that are happening when we're moving, either our self motion or motion of objects in the world relative to us, those are the things that we have to keep track of. And the motion stream, I, I explain in the book how. It can feed into visually based navigation and object tracking through the wear stream. But you do have four motion interaction so that you have good enough representations to track. Absolutely. Yeah, I I think that I think that the visual system in particular, because we're so um, heavily visually or visually focused animals, um, is just a, a great area to kind of explore explore this because for for humans i think our perception of consciousness and visualization in our heads is is largely from from vision um and so you know i i want to get to the book in in a second because um as you mentioned you you do explain that in the book and i think that you explain these topics well and as as listeners i'm sure will be able to gleam you have a, a good way of uh explaining all of this stuff that um, that meets the audience very well. Um, you don't have to be a, a PhD to read this stuff. No, I work very hard so that my grandson can read it. That's wonderful. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it, it definitely came through. It definitely came through. Well, I guess we'll transition uh, in, in a second then. Um, but I, I wanted to ask kind of... Let me just one... say another thing. Yeah. I don't expect everyone who's interested in the book to try to read all of it at once. Mm -hmm. I think it's the kind of book 
you read first the thing that interests you the most and enjoy it, hopefully, and think about it. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you come back again and again and again. So, you know, you don't have to read it all at once to, in order to enjoy it. And I have friends who, they say they, they've read 40% so far and they've liked it a lot. But, you know, now they're putting it down to take a rest. Sure. No, I mean, it's so, I, I think whenever you, you think about these topics, right, it's it's so hard not to read a little bit and then spend 30 minutes thinking about what you just read yeah, and being interested in that and going down thought experiments and thinking through these things, right? And and so it's it's one of those things that it, you don't want to rush through, right? You don't want to just be like, oh, I'm going to read 100 pages in the next couple of days or whatever it is, because I think the beauty in these topics is the ability to think okay, what do, what do I think about about that? How can I apply that? Where are there examples of this in my life? And so I, I think that that's, um, that, that's, that that's very interesting. Well, that's what's kept me going all these years. <laughs> the, the figures too in, the, in, the, in the, the book helped a lot for me personally with understanding some of the concepts um, that you- well, were... You know, that was um, a happy accident in a way because I, I almost, I, for quite a few years, colleagues wanted me to write a lot of stuff down. And so by 1999, I had written down, you know, several tentative chapters, but then I realized there were so many things I didn't understand. I wanted this to be a magnum opus, not just another publication. So I then worked really, really hard for almost 20 years with gifted PhD students and postdocs and made a lot of progress through 2018, including writing my solo paper in 2017 about conscious, you know, seeing, hearing, feeling, knowing, and all that. And at that point, I felt, good, this is a plateau. I could get back to it. And because I had just become emeritus professor, I didn't have to worry about research grants. I no longer had to train PhD students and postdocs, which, mind you, I love. And I trained well over 100 of them. But it's very time consuming. It's like family, you family first. So I finally had the time to really get down and finish it. And that's what happened. But the year before, I, I forgot the most important thing. I hadn't really taught regular classes for years because I was training all these people. That was the condition of my endowed chair to train advanced people. But then there was a new dean who wanted me to teach a regular course. And what the dean wants, her children does. And so I then taught a topics course uh, up to in 2018. And for that course, I created all those color figures. In fact, I had more than 800 of them. And, and they were all in the first copy of the book, but Oxford said, you know, as pretty as they are, 800 makes this book even longer than almost 800 pages. <laughs> so I, it broke my heart, maybe, but I cut out 200 of them. Hey, with the advent of the internet, I'd say, you know, put those yeah. pictures somewhere. because Extra content. <laughs> well, they, I think they are on my web page because I... After I became emeritus, I had a colleague of mine who's our computer jock put all my course PowerPoint on the web. Mm -hmm. So it is there. We'll, we'll definitely make sure to link yeah, that so there in the bottom. It, it yeah, means, what, is, what is the link? Oh, I don't is know. The, okay, well, we'll link it in the bottom. We'll, we'll find it. Yeah, we'll... My page, which is... Sure. S-I-T-E-S, sites.bu.edu slash Steve G. And just start scrolling down to all the videos and what have you and lectures. And gotcha. I find well, papers there for people who want to study details. We will definitely make sure to link that for, yeah, for, our, for our audience as well. You should find it. Or if you send me an email to remind me, I'll send you the URL. Okay, great. 
Fantastic. So hey, we're we're running a little bit uh, low on time here, unfortunately. I, I I by the way, I love this conversation so much. I wish we could go for another hour, um, but but uh, we are running up on time a little bit. So let's get into these book questions. I believe we did already cover one of them. We covered the evolution one. Um, let's maybe talk about um, the the last bit of your book, um, which in where in which you offer some speculation on things like creativity, uh, morality, and religion. Um, could you sort of dive into that theory a little bit more and, and what sort of biological concepts uh, sort of contributed to, to those conclusions that you drew? Sure. Um, okay, so let's start with some comments about creativity. Nothing I'm going to say is sufficient to explain such deep things. Of course. They are relevant and I think they're necessary. So art, which we've discussed, it's after Dresden's theory, provides an example of how simple creativity is part of every learning experience. And by that I mean, when we're learning about new objects or events, art goes through, as I said, memory search or hypothesis testing to discover a new critical, uh, a, new, a new recognition category who has a new critical feature pattern that embodies what is predictive about that information. And that critical feature pattern that's been discovered may be unique to every individual and every experience. That search process and the discovery of what is potentially causal is a simple kind of creativity, unique to every mind. It's not the end of creativity, but if you just had something like deep learning, there isn't a trace of this active discovery process. And it gets more and more creative depending on the attentional primes that an experienced thinker or artist would use to guide the search process. So there's a kind of guided search going on. Right. Now, um, secondly, I didn't have a chance to review with you, but there's a concept of vigilance in art which determines how good a match is required in order to learn about something or to keep triggering a search for another way to represent that information is truly novel. And low vigilance, you, ex you can learn very general uh, and uh, abstract categories. High vigilance, every little difference you need to find another representation. They're very concrete and narrow. And so art usually starts out with the lowest possible vigilance in any learning situation to try to discover the most general recognition categories with which to represent the world at that moment. And that can be done because of vigilance control. Okay, so we generally try to learn the most general categories that lead to predictive success. And so that leads in our minds to a tendency to unify experience with these general categories. And that in primitive societies could lead to a concept of uh, gods and in sure. some societies to a single god. For example, let's say you're in a situation, a primitive society, where there are very few disconfirming experiences. And let's say this is a society where there are occasional very destructive volcanic explosions, which can be very terrifying for mm -hmm. a village that lives beneath it. So it's not that difficult to imagine how they would try to unify these experiences with the concept of a volcano god. Sure. And in their tribal ceremonies, which are initially motivated by fear of the volcano god, let's say they're praying and dancing and God knows using human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and it leads to the end of the volcano explosion. Sure. Well, that may become emotionally very important because it's going to cause huge relief in everyone there. Right. When this happens, a cognitive emotional resonance 
that links the volcano god category with the feeling of relief wow. can be sustained by the tribal ceremonies, right. leading to the superstitious belief that doing these ceremonies can keep the volcano god happy. Yeah. Now, with morality, wow. <laughs> well, I just, I want to, I want to just quickly jump in on that piece because it, it goes into it. I mean, everything links together and it, it goes into what you were saying earlier about, you know, a human's desire to be able to, or, or just animals desire and the, the evolutionary benefit to be able to predict what's coming next. Right. And so events that are very, very complex um, that a primitive society wouldn't have the, the uh, equipment or ability to understand like a volcano going off that not being able to predict is is very scary and so you then be able to come up with um a deity where it feels like there is some level of control and then as you were saying um you know we humans are great at pattern recognition and so if we think that there's a pattern between sacrificing or praying or doing some one of these things then it becomes like okay maybe this is a, a predictor of how we can prevent these events or find some sort of a correlation. Yes, and unlike in primitive societies, members of modern societies often have a lot more control over their environment. And the great advances in our sciences during the past hundred or more years illustrate this kind of control. And here, as part of the scientific method, as we test more and more possible causes of events, we incrementally rule out the incorrect hypotheses that lead to these predictive disconfirmations, as we were saying. And as we get rid of all those predictive disconfirmations, or most of them, we learn the critical features that do describe the true cause. And that's how you can learn a concept of causality incrementally through predictive disconfirmation. So making error is terribly important to figuring out how things really work. Part of the art of living is to make mistakes that are survivable <laughs> and you don't kill yourself. You know, the choice of errors requires a lot of intelligence sometimes. But yeah, I think that's very important. Um, and, you know, then I also talked about a little about religion and morality. You know, I know I'm treading on deep waters, but um, here I, I did want to speak to, again, another fundamental thing, that <coughs> negative experiences, such as ones that cause fear or pain, often lead to our ability to avoid them. We want to terminate them. And in fact, the end of the negativity often leads to a rebound of relief. And that's why, you know, uh, people who've had post-traumatic stress disorder, if they've learned how to control it, are often quite nonchalant and feel mm -hmm. pretty good. It's the ones mm -hmm. who can't control it who are still totally victimized by that fear. But positive experiences are very different, such as the ones that cause happiness or even love, because they are caused by cognitive emotional resonances that can be sustained by these good feelings. And so there's a major asymmetry between negative and positive, where we tend to abort the negative and right. emphasize the positive things that lead to good feelings. And that, I think, creates a little bit of a bias, a symmetry breaking toward doing good, good deeds, because those are the feel-good experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is one of the wellsprings of morality. And then there's a huge amount of culture and history and you know, yeah. dogma. But without that asymmetry, I don't think it would get off the ground. So right. Interesting. One fundamental, but not sufficient fact. So, 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 hey, we're, we're running up against time here. Like I said, it, it, we, unfortunately we have gone a little bit over at this point. Um, you know, I, 
I would love, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, give me um, more time. <laughs> well, I would love, to, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Harrison, but I would love to have Dr. Grossberg back on for another episode in the future. Uh, you yeah. know, we, we only covered a, a fraction of some of the questions. And I think the <laughs> yeah. conversation has, is incredibly it's interesting. Yeah. interesting. Um, but, yeah. you know, I, I think we're going to have to tie it up here, unfortunately. So, Dr. Grossberg, if uh, if people are interested and want to read some of your work or to pick up your book, um, where can they best find that information? Well, the simplest way to find uh, the book, if you want to buy it, is on Amazon. If you just uh, type the title into your computer and click, you will see a link to Amazon. Mm. And then I was selling the hard copy, I think the twenty nine ninety five. Yep. Almost eight hundred pages. That's a bargain. Yeah. And Kindle it's... is nineteen bucks, which is really yeah. compared weird. to what we pay for textbooks. And considering the amount of information that you get in there, I'd say that is a well. It would have cost good deal. more than a hundred. <clears throat> and I won't tell you the story of why it's so reasonably priced, but I worked so hard on it that I negotiated and did what was necessary to get the price down. Yeah, for the content, the price for the content is an incredible value. Huge bang for your buck. Once again, the 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 the, the title of that book is Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain. I recommend the hard copy because I personally like uh, physical, tangible books. Well, when I do is I got my own copies of it. I thought, oh my god, it's heavy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I killed a uh, I killed a bug with it the other day. <laughs> I was sitting here reading. I go boom. <laughs> also, if people are interested in my all my work, um, my web page, you could type Stephen Grossberg and find me at Boston University. But it's s i t e s sites dot b u dot e d u slash Steve G. And there are over 500 of my papers that can be downloaded, videos of keynote lectures I've given around the world, um, lots of stuff. Great. More than, more than you want. <laughs> well, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Grossberg, for, for, for coming on and talking to us. Uh, you're actually one of the first people that we've interviewed in the podcast, so we really appreciate um, the support from you and, and, and the conversation uh, and the insights you've given have been phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I think we would, we, I would speaking for both of us when I say, you know, it would be great to potentially have you on again. So we'll, we'll reach out on, uh, via email and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll send you a link to the video and all that stuff when it, when it's uploaded. Okay. Very good. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. You. you have a great day. Take you care. Too. Bye.